We're here in the Newtown Rivulet. It's low tide, low stream, so I can walk down the middle of it. Today there's a tendency to think of Newtown as being a suburb of Hobart, and it is that, but it wasn't always that way. It used to be its own town. Newtown was its own town, and it was founded just after Collins established a settlement at Sullivan's Cove that became what we think of as being the centre part of Hobart. Today, you can walk around Newtown and it's all very mundane, but it's also mysterious, and there are secrets that are hidden there. You just need to know how and where to look for them. Today, Newtown has a population edging towards six and a half thousand, and its borders are clearly defined. But in the beginning, everything was different. So we're up here at the top of Newtown. This is where Newtown begins. Elizabeth Street from Hobart ends and Newtown Road begins. It's all very modern. There's a lot of traffic going past and a lot of modern buildings. It's hard to imagine this as a rural outpost in any sort of way, but fortunately, there's a very interesting painting that gives us some clues and some insight from the artist's perspective. This 1851 work by Norwegian painter Knut Bull is titled Tollgate Newtown Hobart. The bucolic scene shows how the area looked just two years before the end of convict transportation. Several of the buildings in this image are still here now, and in the middle distance, to the right of the picture, is the Harvest Home Inn. This is what the Harvest Home Inn looked like in the 1880s. Newtown never had many pubs though, unlike other parts of the capital. This is because the area as a whole managed to transition from farmland to suburbia without ever becoming heavily industrialised. In Australia, it was usually the factories that provided an area the supply of workmen who were also drinkers whenever their shift finished. The Harvest Home Inn was de-licensed in 1918 and today the most remarkable thing about the building is that it is unrecognisable. The land route between Hobart Town and the farms around Newtown Bay was one of the first roads in the colony. Today Newtown Road runs the full length of the suburb, but it contains a kind of mistake. There's a weird side road that almost feels like a fork, and it draws motorists towards it like a magnet. In 1818, the Desire Path was formalised into a real road, and it went right up over this incline. In the 1820s, the highway was rerouted to where Newtown Road is now found. This route was slightly longer, but it avoided the steeper gradients at either end, which was important in an era of horse and bullet-drawn transportation. This photo of traffic is circa 1905. This snow photo from the 1880s shows the gentle slopes of the area occupied by semi-rural properties. Agrarian origins have left weirdness in the layout of modern Newtown. The weather keeps changing today. It's gone all chilly right now and the sky's gone what I call Hobart grey. It's that washed out grey that we get here that's got maybe like three to five percent blue in it. Anyhow I'm not here to talk about the weather, I'm here to talk about this road. This is Seymour Street and it's extra wide, wider than the average suburban street in Hobart. Why is it this wide? Well back when surveyors were mapping out these jagged streets they used a length of measurement that was called the chain. Now the chain had 100 individual links in it and by imperial measurements it was 66 feet like that. You can understand the practicality of having an actual physical chain to go and measure things back in those days. Well, this width of road is not common but it is common elsewhere in Australia, and that's on the cricket pitch. The cricket pitch is 66 feet long because that's how long the chain was.
Come on, dog. Up here on the domain, on the loop that everybody likes to run around, or in my case, walk the dog around. Come on, mate, come on. It's very much its own animal at this point. There's this sign here that says, danger, quarry face, trespassers prosecuted. Well, I'm not gonna trespass, but I'm here to point out that behind this cyclone fence is a quarry. And then after the quarry, there's Newtown and then there's the mountain and then above that, of course, the sky. This quarry is like a lot of places in Hobart. Lots of areas of Hobart are actually quarries. You just don't recognise them as such because they've been filled in with things over time. Buildings have gone into them. They've been revegetated. People have found new uses for them. This quarry is special. Special to Newtown because the material that was taken out of it was used to build pretty much all the roads in Newtown when they were first setting up the place. Come on, mate. Come on. This is why I carry the dog. Constable Malcolm Cleary patrolled the domain from 1865 to 1884. During this period, the government leased out the domain for grazing purposes. To prevent stock from wandering off, the domain was encircled with a giant fence. The house at the centre of this picture was where Constable Cleary and his family lived, and the gates to the domain fence were adjacent. The street in front of the house was Park Street, a street that is now the Brooker Highway. The government developed a quarry at the bottom of what became known as Cleary's Gates Road. This quarry, along with another one called Jutland Quarry, provided all of the gravel that was used to build most of the roads in Newtown. We're here at one of these weird intersections that Newtown has. That we're at Bishop Park and Gowrie. Now we're here because this intersection has two things that Hobart doesn't really have anymore. One is this building here. It used to be a corner store. Now, when they opened it, the original owners wanted to call it the Anzac Corner Store, but the powers that be said that was gauche. You can't do that. So instead they just reversed the letters and called it the Kasna store. Over here, we've got what used to be a toll house. Now, what we think of as toll houses or toll booths. So a fair bit of fast traffic here. It's definitely uh, pushing the limits of the uh, legal speed. Anyhow, this is a, a toll house here, and uh, well, it used to be a toll house. Now, when we think of tolls, we think of um, like car parks, where you've got a toll gate that comes up and down. Well, they didn't have those in the 1800s. What they had instead was a length of chain, or maybe a rope. But normally it was a chain And what they did was they had the chain pulled tight and then once you handed over your money, they'd drop the chain to the ground. So you on your horse or your carriage would go through and go about your day. Now, you can see why they put a toll house here because even now in 2022, there's a lot of traffic. The Park Street toll house still resembles what it was. The others in Newtown have been dissolved with the passage of time. Without an obvious focal point, Newtown is perhaps defined and identified by a series of odd intersections. And the busiest of them all is the six ways at Maypole. Built in the 1860s, the toll house here stood for a century after the toll system itself was abolished. Yet today, it is of course gone. On one of the other corners is one of the last dine-in pizza huts in Australia. Once ubiquitous, their days are numbered. With just 12 left in the entire country, they are, 
and endangered species. And one of the other corners is the mock Tudor Maypole, the building that gives the intersection its name. This pub, right in the heart of Newtown, has been rebuilt several times. This is the Maypole in 1870. This photo of the junction, circa 1973, shows Newtown as it was 50 years ago. The built environment has changed greatly since then and will again most likely change all over in the next 50 years. Newtown doesn't have a town square. There's no civil space for civil activities. Hobart has a town square, Glenorchy has a town square. Newtown doesn't and it suffers for it. The closest thing would be the Kmart car park. By the late 1820s, Newtown had become a semi-rural retreat for some of Van Diemen's Land's wealthiest individuals. Those people lobbied Lieutenant Governor George Arthur for a church to be built there. Designed by colonial engineer and architect John Lee Archer and erected with forced convict labour, St John's Anglican Church was completed in 1835. John Lee Archer had been given the responsibility for all government buildings and he held a position for 11 years. Among other things, he built the Ross Bridge and Parliament House. But in 1838, Lieutenant Governor John Franklin abolished the role. He did this to cut costs. Archer was only 47 years old at the time, and he would have built many more great buildings had he not been stopped. In some ways, the island never recovered from this. The bureaucratic decision was made to walk away from aesthetic progress. There's always a lot of talk in Hobart and in Tasmania about how we had to hang on to heritage, how we shouldn't have let so many great buildings be demolished. Well, all that's true, but what isn't discussed is how culture is often stifled, how something like this could be put up and the bloke in charge could find himself out of a job. It's part of the culture in Tasmania, sometimes to let visions of the future die in the cradle. We may know the things lost to us, but harder it is to know the things that were never allowed to be given. <laughs>